talking this morning, the deal is that when this is all said and done, all right. you're going to well, see a right. report, and it, it's cumulative from all the data, but it'll give me, and we can actually look at individual reps if we want, but it'll give me how quick, every time there's a, a bumper comes up, how quick yeah, do you take that first step in that direction? So my reaction to that stimulus that comes up. Then, secondly, how quickly can I accelerate to top speed? So what's my acceleration? Then uh, what is your top speed when you get going? And then this is where we were talking with Kevin and I have been chatting about this for the last couple months, is we get a deceleration uh, quotient. And it's basically looking at frame rates and it knows your speed, it knows how quick you slow down. So it's, the formula is actually correct, how it's doing acceleration. Acceleration's a positive, deceleration's a negative number that comes up. The first thing, when I went back to them and Kevin and I were talking about it, says, well, you can get a deceleration score, but I noticed there's differences on some of this stuff with the big guys and the little guys. So we need to take a factor I think we need to put into the equation, which they have in there would be momentum, because momentum is nothing more than velocity times mass. Uh, that you have, so already at their top speed. So we've actually, and Phil's been working on the math on a whiteboard with me, figuring out how to come up with a ratio of, um, originally we're calling it a change of direction score, where I know how quickly you can decelerate into a target, because I think that's where the problem is, then how quick can you accelerate out of that target, and then Kevin threw into the mix, was Kevin and I talking, well, wait a minute, it's not just the target, because what if you overshot your, well, we see that a lot, people can overshoot the target, and then based on what the discussion was yesterday with Craig and Tim and Kevin talking, we started playing around with this idea. And then the next thing we started to see is some of these guys on a quick test, the numbers look really good. But if you have them go, hence the 90 seconds, 90 seconds, you'll see their values, their deceleration, change of direction and overshoot goes up the tighter they get. Well, that's when people are getting hurt. And so now we've got a formula come in where it's a, uh, Here's what they did on their first five reps. Here's what they did on their last five reps. You can see the rate of decay of their ability to change direction and, and be accurate. Or Kevin's, we're using on Kevin's term, the overshoot is change of direction deficit. They just can't stop quick enough and get turned around. And what we think in sort of editorializing, what I think happens in with a lot of our athletes is, and Bobby kind of validated that yesterday a little bit at lunch we were talking. I think that strength coaches are really good at uh, trying to build a bigger engine. They can build the horsepower, they put big Ferrari engines, but they're putting them on Volkswagen frames. So it's like that Ford versus Ferrari movie. And yeah, we can build a bigger engine, but if you're building that engine, you better build a better braking system because you gotta stop the car. You can go pretty fast, but you're still hitting the wall. So if you put this up, we can yeah, look at, you want to get an overview? Yeah, it's slow here. So look at symmetry here. So that was Ash going left versus right, right? Mm -hmm. And reacting. Okay. Well, we can go back to the overview, but. Now we color code it, so yellow, you know, 10 to 20% is yellow, oh, what's right? As I say, what's interesting, George, is what this red. seems to follow, what we're looking at, at least the data we have, lots of data on this, was it seems to follow the isolated joint testing type of things we look at where, again, it's still a best <coughs> guess on my part, but if you're within 10% on symmetry, you're pretty good. It looks like on this when we do it, kind of with some of your stuff you've done, the gray area is 10 to 20 in there, don't really know, but I can tell you if you're greater than 20% deficit, you, you probably have some issues of movement with this. And so now it's just color coded, that it'll be red, yellow, green, uh, just to show you. But it does follow your work with uh, with isokinetics with our numbers we did, it seems to be at that. Same thing on these, rate, these uh, this is your, your where you can get the vector and move the radials. Uh, following what Russ was saying this morning, we had the discussion, Again, anecdotally, because I do think there's something here, but it's the backwards right and backwards left where they have the biggest deficits on the movements. They seem to go pretty good going forward, but backwards is where we see the people Can struggle. Can you change, change in the settings of dimensions of the field? You can, you can in the drill section. So if you want to make it a six inch by six inch, or just do like a hip shift, you can do that, where you can expand it. Now, we can only expand to the six by six area, basically. So we say 10 by 10 for safety reasons. But uh, you can only spin a six by six. With the new camera we're about to launch now, it allows you to go to a 20 by 20. So it, for, for performance applications, it might be really valuable, right? Can you, so, can you, can you take out yeah, 20 feet by 20 feet. Well, you, you're talking about acceleration, deceleration, but you know, if you look at Kevin's videos earlier, mm. he's got guys are about 20 yards. Yeah. You know, I mean, it could be. Your, your peak speed is going to be 30 yards to get to peak speed. Uh, well, that might be true, but. Uh, I, now, not don't necessarily. Be, don't be it, that's a sport thing because you're thinking football. Oh. 
You don't have 30 yards in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a key that I'm working off of. Because what we do with our NBA guys, you do the same thing. Except we put the ball, it's that it's the thing Bob was talking about with this yeah. guy. Put the ball in the hand and do those same drills and put it out in the court and let them practice this. And now they're doing two different activities at the same time for, for movement. And you'll see, again, they can get to their top speed pretty quick against some of those athletes. The other thing is like, consistency of the flow. I can't believe. You, you have carpet? Like, how often do you have to change that carpet? <laughs> <laughs> we have some ribs, but... Uh, we have it on rubber, rubber yeah. floor. I, I would love to know the feedback from the group, because yeah, you bring up a good point that I've heard before, but when I, when I, the, my retort's always been, what's more important than your ability to stop, start, change direction? I don't care if you're a lineman, a linebacker, I mean, the, you're, you're working in a, typically in a very small space, so like when we run 40-yard dashes in football, I think we all know, you know, how many studies have been out saying what you do in a in a track meet in March has no relevance to your, you know, your success in a field of play in September, it's because they're all pre planned movements. It's all about reactive phase, change of direction, at least from my perspective. And again, it's a limited perspective compared to this group. But your ability to stop, start, and change direction in a very small space, I think, dictates a lot of times your overall performance on the field. Unless you're a track and field runner, right? Like if you're running track and field, it's a different story. But uh, almost every sport I can think of, whether you're a shortstop, a second baseman, a first baseman, a, a third baseman, it doesn't matter. You're playing a very small space. It's your ability to stop, start, change direction, and react. I think, and I, I might be wrong, but that's uh, this is a clinical version of catapult yeah. kinetics. Yeah, I mean, we've done this. You talk about you guys could go out in the field. We've done this with the NHL teams at their training camp. You put it on the ice. Yeah, and they put do it on the ice skates. Yeah. They do that exact same drill: stick, skates, puck, and they're moving all over, and we're getting data. And it's interesting. On some of the NHL guys that told us, when we told them where their movement deficits were on the overview, where you could see that, the players kind of knew it. They said, I kind of knew that, but they didn't tell anybody. But I, we know where their problems are. And then what we'll do is we build a program where they, they forces them into the deficit areas to, to work at it. The other thing that's kind of cool, this is just me, it doesn't change thing. although it might fit with Bob's work, but he's talking about vision. Uh, again, it has nothing to do with you on the thing. You, this is just your monitor, so this has doesn't matter. So in my lab at school, I have this on a 12-foot screen, so it's like you're standing there looking at the whole thing in front of you. The clinic, we have an 80-inch screen uh, built into the wall, so it's, it's kind of more, the bigger it gets, it's like that screen, that, that picture. It's kind of like, the, it's more realistic what you're seeing right in front of you when you're doing it. Yeah, the Galvan has a 90-inch TV. It's well, that's his big claim. He said inch. seven of the eight lap, seven of the eight yeah, well, all, national the champions six, in football. If you do it that one, or the last six. He wants to say the last. I Georgia and Alabama, but <laughs> hey, <it's laughs> but no, I, 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 so, so this is one other area I'd love to get all your collective feedback on. It's the neuromechanical realm, right? right? Uh, and you're all familiar with the term, obviously, Sorry, but uh, right uh, it's right. including yeah. cognitive challenges with movement or the illicit movement. So. Math problems, flank, is everybody familiar with the flanker test in the room? Like, so a four year, um, year old neuropsych test, you'll see here in a second. Five arrows across the top, they can be congruent or incongruent, right? You're focused on a center arrow. That center arrow is the direction you're supposed to move to, right? So we can do that with lateral or diagonals or multi-directional, but um, or we can put math problems in. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, but I would love to have your collective feedback at some point in regards to the incorporation, like Gary, we were talking about yesterday, of the brain and body together and how that might impact rehabilitation, right? So let me, uh, let me jump in real quick. I'll do it myself this time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Just what I did. What's that like? Yeah. More. All right, so I'm going to start out with just the LAS, which you already saw. So I don't know which side the bumper's going to pop to. And I'm going to go, and now I'm on this uh, baseball field. So this is eight reps here. And this was developed, actually, guys, by, uh, you know, the guys down in Georgia, Ron Corson, those guys, and Jeff Allen and Marucci. And we had eight of, eight of these guys come together and say, hey, what's the best assessment for our players in regards to lower extremity function as well as brain function? So now it's going to take that. Now it's going to add the flanker is what I really want you to see. So here's the flanker. You'll see those arrows across the top. All right, so now I'm going to move to the direction of that middle arrow. So it points, and it's at 500 milliseconds on the assessment itself, but you can decrease it or increase the time and the drills, you can make it harder or, or more static. So for a senior population, 
they might we, we just might make it static on the screen so that they you know they don't have they can sit there and process 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 and then move for a pro athlete i've seen guys get down to 50 milliseconds and just kill it which i can't see the damn thing uh, or you can have it jumping around the screen um, i'm laughing i'm like how the hell do you guys even see it uh, but or you can have it jump around so there's some eye tracking component to it right it doesn't have to be static at the top we can have it jump around and flank or two and it goes everywhere now real quick i'll show you the back Right, so now if we go to the back to the diagonals. No. Yeah, right. Oh, 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 I'm almost ran Bob. Oh, is that Bob? <laughs> Sorry, Bob. All right, so hey, so you get the point. But then you'll add the cognitive challenge on top of that, right? So Again, now you're having to decipher which way I go based on the kind of challenge as well as the motor function. We can compare the variance between the two. And and we don't know what the norm, norm variance should be yet. But I'd love to generate that data, right? Like, how well do you move from a motor standpoint? Then when you add a cognitive challenge on top of that, what's the norm? And then when you're outside of norm, is there a cognitive deficiency there that we need to solve for, right? So, so any questions? I don't want to keep you guys.